All right, let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. We have been going through the Sermon on the Mount, and Pastor Steve has led us in that and has given us a lot of great information, and my assignment today is to uh, talk to you um, from Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to start at verse 19, and we're going to go all the way down through to verse 34. That's Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, going through to verse 34. And it reads, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So, if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Some translations say mammon. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you, being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field and how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you Need them all. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Let's pray, family. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this day, this opportunity for this time, Lord God. I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for your people. I thank you for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. Lord, I thank you for the presence of your powerful spirit. Lord God, I ask that you would give us wisdom, Lord God. I ask that you would give us peace in our hearts and our minds. Lord, I ask that you would speak to us even now, Lord God, that we can hear from you. Give us understanding, Lord, as we discuss your word. You are truly awesome. You're great. You're good. This is our prayer we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Family, I believe that it's important to have self-confidence. We've all heard that term before, right? We talk about it a lot. And it truly breaks my heart sometimes when I see people that maybe walk around with a defeated kind of attitude. And I, it breaks my heart because as human beings, at least here in America, you know, we really do have the power to change our circumstances in life. Yet, while self-confidence is important, we also have to keep in mind that uh, it could be dangerous to uh, be a little overly confident or desperately confident. I think when this happens, I think we are blind to reality sometimes and, and maybe can often make hasty or sometimes catastrophic decisions. Not only that, but I think that there's also the danger of, with overconfidence, I think there's the danger of making ourselves maybe even into our own gods. We're more concerned about what it is that we want, and um, regardless of what God's word might say, I think I know what's best. 
So self-confidence is good, but at the same time, there needs to be a, 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 a balance of it. And with that in mind, I think I have to ask the question, as Christians then, as the body of Christ, do we really think that we should be relying on ourselves instead of God? I'm sure everyone in here would give me an, a, a resounding, absolutely not. See, in God's economy, there's a standard that God wants us to follow. And with that in mind, I'd like to make a comparison really quick between God confidence and self-confidence. And hopefully we can see that God confidence is truly the only way to go. Dictionary.com gives us two definitions of self-confidence. Uh, the first definition is a realistic confidence in one's own judgment, ability, and power. Let me say that again. If you Google it, thank God for the technology age, you can find out anything you want to know. But dictionary.com puts it this way. First definition, a realistic confidence of one's own judgment, ability, and power. And the second definition goes like this. It's not a realistic one, but an excessive or inflated confidence in one's own judgment or ability. First realistic, then excessive. That's dictionary.com. But I think we can all agree that self-confidence ultimately comes down to this. It's all about me. And as Christians... These definitions then would go completely against the grain of what God wants for us, wouldn't you say? So I would define it like this, self-confidence versus God's confidence. Self-confidence is to have a worldly focus or being concerned about the cares of this world when we compare that to what Scripture says, which means then that we typically place our confidence into things like money, education, people, status, and even our appearance. Whereas God confidence, God confidence is to have a godly focus. It is to, as the Bible says, seek those things that are from above. God confidence, family, I believe that God confidence means that we depend completely upon God and his strength to handle any situation in our life. And I think that this is what Jesus was getting at here in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 34, as he moves on through and his instructions in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1934. Before we go there, family, now see, I'm that guy that I, I just... I want to try to bring the word to life for you. I want to hopefully put you into the story so that you can see that these are real people going through real events in a real time in history, and they're really hearing from God. So if you don't mind, I'd like to take you back for context purposes so that we can understand everything that's being said here in the Sermon on the Mount. And also, I hope, I hope that you can get a greater understanding of the mindset of the people who are being spoken to, and even what might be going through Jesus' mind as he speaks. In case you're wondering about that, it's not a bad thing to hear the same thing over and over again. I know we've already summarized this before several times throughout this series, but um, uh, this is how we gain ownership of the word. This is how we commit things to memory. So check it out. Here you go. I'm going to go back. I'm going to go way back. Are you ready? No? We're not ready? We're ready. All right. Genesis chapter 1. We all know the story. In the beginning, God. Right there in Genesis chapter 1, we know that God is the main character of the story. Right here in the Word. This is God's story. It opens up with Him. In the beginning, God. God created all that there is. Immediately, it tells us that this story that we're about to get into is not about us, but it's about God and God's eternal plan and purpose for the world goes on, God creates man, and God gives man one rule. He says to man, you can eat from any tree in the garden, but from this particular tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. Adam, the day that you eat from that tree, you will surely die. We know the story, though. Man drops the ball, and what does he do? He eats from the tree. It's important to note, though, that before Adam ate from the tree, Eve ate first, but God didn't step on the scene until Adam took the fruit, and then he ate from the tree. But the story then goes on. 
Adam and Eve populate the earth. Genesis chapter 6 reminds us that mankind becomes increasingly corrupt and wicked. What does God do? God sends a flood to destroy the earth. You all remember the story, right? And then he repopulates the earth through Noah and his family. Story goes on. Genesis chapter 11. Mankind flourishes, but then starts to get too big for its britches in building the Tower of Babel. God says, oh, no, we can't have this because they want to be like God. They are trying to build a tower up to the heavens. What does God do? God gives them different languages and spreads them all across the earth. Nations are created right there in Genesis chapter 11, along with different languages and di different cultures. And then in Genesis chapter 12, God chooses a nation of people to represent him in the earth. Out of all the many nations upon the earth, he chooses one nation for himself. He did not choose a nation from Africa. He did not choose a nation from Europe. He did not choose a nation from Asia. But a people group he chose, he chose from the Middle East. And then he called them Israel. And he says to them in Deuteronomy 29, 13, he says to Israel, I will be your God and you will be my people. After this, family, as the story goes on, Israel flourished with God, and God then makes a covenant with Israel. And if we read in our Bibles in 2 Samuel chapter 7, please forgive me, I should have had some slides for you today, but if you want to let your fingers do the walking, turn with me please in 2 Samuel chapter 7, and I want to read to you the Davidic covenant. The Davidic covenant, this is the covenant that God made with David, and this is one of the first references that we hear in Scripture about this kingdom this promised kingdom. But in 2 Samuel chapter 7, starting at verse 9, David, the second king of Israel, he's doing a bang-up job. God is really pleased with him. And so God says to David, through his prophet Nathan, here in 2 Samuel, God says, David, and I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make your name great like the name of the great ones of the earth i will appoint a place for my people israel and plant them so that they may dwell on in their own place and be disturbed no more and violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that i appointed judges over my people israel i will give you rest from all your enemies Moreover, the Lord declares to David, to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. God says to David, I'm going to raise up your offspring after you that's going to come from you, and I will establish his kingdom. Verse 13, he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Have you noticed how many I will, I will, I will? The Lord declares over and over again. I think God is a God that keeps his promises, is he not? He goes on, I will be to him a father, that is your offspring, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever in accordance with all these words and in accordance with all this vision Nathan spoke to David. So family, what we have right here in 2 Samuel chapter 7 is one of the first references to this promised kingdom. And in case you're wondering who this offspring is that is spoken of in 2 Samuel, well, we know that the promised king that comes from David's bloodline is who? Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. The Bible gives us more reference toward this. If we want to turn in our Bibles, or just you can listen briefly to Isaiah chapter 9. We're all familiar with this passage of Scripture. Isaiah chapter 9 speaks of the coming Messiah. It says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, 
And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. What am I getting at here? So here we have all throughout the Old Testament this promised kingdom belonging to Israel. Israel is the chosen nation of God. Israel has been told from their whole lineage, God is going to reign and rule on earth through you forevermore. And so as we go throughout history, Israel is constantly waiting on this particular promise. Now, what do we see happening next here? I think I got ahead of myself in my notes. But the gospel speaks of this. When we read Matthew, when we read the book of Matthew, it actually picks up, put, picks up where the Old Testament leaves off, and that is with the promise of the kingdom. Some people might even say that when you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, rather than it actually being the beginning of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is more of an extension of the Old Testament because it actually picks up where the Old Testament left off. But look at what happens between Malachi and Matthew. Remember, I'm trying to put you in this story and help you to understand how the people are thinking during that ancient time when Jesus first stepped on the scene. So you had 400 years of silence between Matthew and Malachi. The prophets weren't speaking the way they were in the Old Testament, but the people still knew and believed in this promise that God had given them. There was also, during this time, the rise of Jewish religious sects. You didn't hear anything about the Pharisees, the Sadducees, or the scribes in the Old Testament. But during this time, all of this stuff started to happen prior to Christ stepping on the scene. Not only that, but you also see the rise of synagogues. In the Old Testament, where did the people go? Well, they went to the temple. The temple still existed, but in Jesus' time, there was this synagogue now all of a sudden that the people went to for fellowship and to hear the word of God. Not only that, but during this time, Israel had went through various uh, um, disputes and uh, all types of civil wars. Maybe you've heard from history the, the War of the Maccabees or the Maccabean re 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 Revolt and things of that nature. Um, and not only that, but during this time, what do we see? The rich is getting richer and the poor is getting poor and sickness and disease continue to run rampant. Another thing we happen to see during this time is that Jewish zealots were constantly rebelling against Roman rule. Some other things we see during this time is that the region, this region that Israel was in, Israel, this region had become a religiously and politically volatile region, like a powder keg ready to explode. I, I, I remember Pastor Steve mentioned in the show uh, The Chosen. If you haven't had a chance to watch that, you should watch it because I think it paints a really good picture of the cultural events that took place during that time. But there was a lot that was happening prior to Jesus stepping on the scene. Another thing we see is the king of Israel at that time, who is Herod. Well, Herod's actually a madman. He's kind of like a maniac. And he's also known to be this puppet kind of king that, uh, for the Jews that was put in place by the Roman officials for their own selfish interest. But nonetheless, family, when we read God's story and when we understand history, and how these things took place. It was in the midst of this darkness right here that God steps into mankind, steps into their whole programming, kind of disrupts it, and became directly involved in man's affairs as John the Baptist prepares the way. One might even say that during this time, this was the worst of times. But then you could also say, that with Christ's arrival, with this first appearance of God himself in the flesh stepping onto the earth, it was also the best of times. So here we have Matthew chapter 6, which, is the be which starts off with the beginning of um, Jesus' public ministry. Now, as I said before, some look at the four Gospels as, you know, maybe an extension of the Old Testament picks up where the 
Old Testament leaves off with the promise. The Gospels are also, as we know, are autobiographies of this promised Messiah. The Messiah is spoken of for hundreds of years, and now here he comes. It's the Messiah. He's on the scene. And now we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to tell us all about the life and earthly ministry of the Messiah. Now, given the political and cultural atmosphere, I'm going somewhere with all of this backdrop that I'm giving you, given the political and cultural atmosphere of the time, I think that it is easy to see that Israel, or possibility anyway, Israel, with this information of the kingdom coming, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, Israel maybe didn't look at heaven the way that you and I do today. You and I believe that in the afterlife, we're going straight to heaven because of our relationship with Christ. When our time is up on earth, we're going to heaven. And that's not to say that Israel wasn't thinking about going to heaven. But what I'm trying to say is that I think that a large part of their thinking at the time was the kingdom. Ruling and reigning on earth with Christ, with the Messiah, forevermore. Now, Jesus comes and he says, repent for the kingdom that I was telling you about. The kingdom is at hand. So not only would it be that their primary concern was the kingdom that was promised, but I also think that um, uh, one of the things that Israel was concerned about was being more prosperous in life. And this is going to help us understand what Jesus is talking about here in 6, 19 to 34. Concern of the promised kingdom concern of being more prosperous in life and not only that but Israel's concern is getting away from Roman rule who wouldn't think about that right from the time you were a child you're hearing about the promised kingdom I want to know this kingdom from the time you were a child you're hearing about you as a nation being chosen to represent the true and living God a nation of priests I want to talk about a more prosperous life and then not to mention with all of the wars and rumors of wars or all of the little revolts and riots and things of that nature with the zealots going on and, and within the community, who doesn't want to get away from Roman rule? These were some things that were on the mind of the people as Jesus steps onto the scene. The promised king, here he comes. He steps out there. Matthew chapter 1, we read about his genealogy. That's why. Because the king has been spoken of, and Matthew wants us to know that the king is now here. Matthew chapter 2, we read about the secured entrance of the king. Matthew chapter 3, the preparation of the king, John. And then Matthew chapter 4, we read and start to see the beginning of the king's earthly ministry. What did he say? What did he do when he came? He came preaching, repent, for the kingdom that was promised is now at hand. Imagine, Jesus was saying in so many words, yo, it's about to go down. You all know, you heard what was, talk, was spoken of before. The time has come, now it's time for you to repent. What did he do to assist with this message to show who he was? He performed many miracles to demonstrate that he was in fact the promised one prophesied over the last hundreds of thousands of years and then in Matthew 5 through 7 we read one of the earliest and most profound sermons ever recorded given by the king that is the sermon on the mount and in the sermon on the mount family this is what we all want to remember that during this time as Jesus proclaimed as Jesus gave these instructions what is the sermon on the mount all about Sermon on the Mount, Jesus the King declares the reality of living life in the promised kingdom with the King. So as we read this, we have to understand that what we're getting here are the realities of life being lived in the kingdom. In this sermon, Jesus gives the basic requirements to enter the promised kingdom. Let me say that again. It's significant to note that when we read this, what we're getting are the basic requirements to enter into the kingdom. In the Sermon on the Mount, this is why Jesus mentions the kingdom is at hand. Now that the kingdom is at hand, there must be, and this is what Jesus is getting at, 
I've told you, I've promised you about the kingdom. Now that the kingdom is at hand, Israel, there must be genuine purity. This is what Jesus is talking about to them. There must be genuine purity. This is what he meant, this is what he meant when he said in chapter 5, verse 20, that except your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, don't even think about entering into the kingdom of heaven. Can you imagine that? Now, the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, nobody was more holy than them. Imagine walking around, and they thought that that was the way it was supposed to be done. And they're being told that unless your righteousness exceeds that, can you imagine the thinking of the people? What do you mean? Nobody's more holy than the scribes and the Pharisees. But what Jesus was getting at was a matter of the heart. Keep in mind, Jesus wasn't the love, peace, and hair crease type of dude that culture makes him out to be. That's not who our Savior was. I would like to believe that our Savior was actually the epitome of what a man should be. So he said some things very boldly, and he said some things that were very profound things. So profound that we might forget when reading Scripture that some of the people actually walked away from Christ. Not everyone in the crowd stayed committed to him. If we read the Gospel of John, for example, John gives us a little bit more insight into the thinking of the people. For example, um, in John chapter 6, verse 22 to th through 26, Jesus said this to the people around the same time frame with the crowds following him on the Sermon on the Mount. He said to the people, he said, you guys are seeking me because you saw the miracles, but I know that you're only here because you're hungry and you want to be filled. That's what Jesus was saying. In John chapter 6, verse 22 to, through 26, he also said this. This is a hard saying. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Because they couldn't handle a lot of the stuff that Jesus was saying to them. So keep in mind, the weightiness of Jesus' teaching is important to point out as it shows us that Jesus had one primary emphasis and that emphasis was the issue of the heart. When we read the Sermon on the Mount, and especially as we get here to Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 34, it is reiterated that the most important thing that Christ is concerned about, particularly with the people of Israel, as we read this story, are the issues of the heart. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 34. As we read this, family, this is one paragraph. This is actually one paragraph that covers one subject. That one subject is, I would like to submit to you, is total spiritual dedication. Total spiritual dedication. As I said, it also comes down to basically the issue of the heart. Now, as we break this down and unpack Matthew 19, I'm sorry, 6, starting at 19, let's keep in mind that there are, there is what I'd like to call an immediate context and there is an overall context. That was my purpose of giving you this, this huge backdrop because I want you to understand the immediate context of what's been said to the people of Israel. But I also want you to understand the overall context as well. So with the immediate context, what we're getting is who's talking, that being Jesus, who he's talking to, that is the people of Israel, what's he talking about, that is the kingdom of God that was promised, and what was going on at the time. In the overall context, what we're going to get is how this passage applies to us today. That's happening in this overall context of it. Now, the central theme of this passage, Matthew 6, 19 through 34, the central theme as we look at that in conjunction to what the rest of the Sermon of the Mount is about, the central theme of this passage I'd see as total abandonment, total abandonment of all financial assets and trust in the Lord's daily provision. Now, there is where things might get a little tricky and maybe even debatable because of what I just said, that the central theme of Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 34, would be total abandonment of all financial assets and trust in the Lord's daily provision. I hope to be able to show you this here in just a second. And it is a passage that also sheds light on the manner of prayer taught 
to Jesus' disciples when he said to pray, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Jesus said, the apostles asked, how should we pray? One of the instructions he gave him as they pray, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. So what Jesus is getting at here with the apostles, I submit to you, is that one of the realities of living life in the kingdom is total dependence on him for their daily provision. Now, when we read, say, verse 19, which says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. When we read that, typically... One of the ways of explaining it is, well, I might say something like, well, it doesn't exactly mean that, but what it means is this. I want to challenge you for a second, and I want to submit to you that it means exactly what it says it means. What did Jesus say? He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Did you get that? Don't be worried about saving money. This is what he's saying. Now, this, how are we going to think about this now? We live in America, okay? We're a prosperous nation. Most of us work and we got jobs and all that great stuff. But Jesus is saying right here in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, he says, don't be laying up for yourselves treasures on earth. Don't worry about none of that. How's that? What are you talking about, Jesus? Family, I think that what Jesus is saying right here, now this is maybe arguable and maybe debatable. There's different schools of thought on this, but I believe that when Jesus says, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, I don't think there's anything symbolic or allegorical here at all. I don't. Now, we know that he is using some allegory as he explains the eye, for example. The eye is, um, if the eye is healthy and, and light comes in, we know that that's a figurative way of speaking. But right here, I believe that this is a direct command. In other words, life in the kingdom requires you to trust in God and God alone for your daily provisions. Life in the kingdom requires you to trust God and God alone for your daily provisions. Now, there are different schools of thoughts on this. There are some that might say that the kingdom um, is right now as God rules and reigns in our hearts. And then there are some that might say that the kingdom is not yet to come it's still to come and then there are others that still might say that the kingdom is now and not yet the kingdom is now in the sense that God rules and reigns in our hearts but we all believe that Christ is coming back one day and as he comes back we know that that physical literal kingdom that was spoken of in Samuel and spoken of in the Old Testament will take place how that's going to happen it's a little debatable but we know that Jesus is coming back is he not and I thank God for that. So as we keep this in mind, family, this direct command, what Israel is being said here, I'd like to challenge you to think that or to know that what he's saying is that in the kingdom, life in the kingdom, even right now, as God rules and reigns in your heart, one of the things that God looks for us to do is to trust him and him alone for our daily provision. But scripture means what it says. It says what it says. It means what it says. Now, to support what I just said to you, I think that, once again, life in the kingdom, you trust God, period. You ain't worrying about going to work and paying bills and none of that. You trust God. Why else would I say that? Well, if we look at other parts of the Bible, for example, all throughout the Gospels, we'll see Jesus saying things like this. When Jesus called the apostles, uh, chapter 4 of Matthew, chapter 4, verse 19 through 20, when Jesus called the apostles, the Bible says that they left their nets or they left their businesses and followed him. They just left it. They left it there and they went to follow him. They weren't thinking about where their next meal was coming from. Peter said this, Lord, in Matthew 19, he said, Lord, we have forsaken all and followed you. So they just left everything behind. Not only that, but in Matthew 19, when a young man asked how he can have eternal life, Matthew 19, 27, 
I'm sorry, Matthew 19, 16 through 17, uh, Jesus said to the young man who wanted eternal life, Jesus said to him, sell all that you have and give to the poor. That's what Jesus said. Not only that, but we read in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, that Jesus says, if you don't forsake all that you have, you can't even be my disciple. How many of y'all are, are, are wanting to leave your job right now to be Christ's disciple? That, that, we're not being told that we got to work, right? But yet right here in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says that do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Now, if this is a true literal statement, then how do we work out things like, let's say, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, which says this, If anyone does not provide for his own, especially those of his own house, he's denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Did you see that? How do you work that out? In one place, in this, if this is in fact a direct command, in one place it says, don't worry about laying up treasures. In another place in scripture it says, if you don't work, if you don't provide for your family, you've denied the faith and you're worse than an infidel. Does the Bible contradict itself? I don't think so. I think it's complete harmony going on there. Well, how about this? 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, where Paul basically says, if you don't, know, if you don't work, you don't eat. How do we work that out? Jesus said right here, with reality in the kingdom, that not to lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. But then over here, <laughs> later on down the road, it says, if you don't work, you don't eat. How do we work that out? What I'm trying to say to you, family is that what Jesus is getting at here is that this is reality of life within the promised kingdom that he spoke about way back when in the Old Testament. That when the people of God are going to rule and reign with him on earth in this kingdom, there will not be any needs at all. Your daily provisions will be provided for. All of your food and your lodging and your clothing, all of that stuff will be provided for. And this is what Jesus is getting at in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 34. So what's it all about? Treasures that cannot be destroyed with moth and rust. When I read that family, what I'm seeing here is that there is a way to develop what I call in here God confidence. And that's what Jesus is trying to point out to the people. That this is a whole nother different ball game. This is a, a countercultural type of uh, thinking that he's presenting before them. What's normal is to go out and to work and to provide, to get dressed, to get in my car, to get in the traffic and go, that's normal to take care of my family. But what Jesus is offering here, what he's instructing here is something totally not normal. It's not normal at all. But even though I believe that Jesus is giving a key uh, a, a, a statement and instructions to Israel in regard to the coming kingdom, I also believe in that overall context that there are principles that you and I can glean from this today as well. Because just like Israel is pointed out that they should trust God for everything, so are you and I today. Even though in the kingdom they don't have to worry about their food, you and I do today. So when we look at this here, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Treasures on this, in, in this earth, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth or rust destroys, or where neither thieves do not break in and steal. What type of treasures on earth is Jesus talking about here? Well, back then there was really two primary ways that you could build wealth. That was from some type of agricultural food, or maybe even clothing. So what Jesus is getting at here is that these shouldn't be your concern, Israel. Worry, worry about your food or worry about your, 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 your clothing. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Sometimes I've heard it said before that um, uh, if you want to know what a person's heart is really all about, just take a look at their checkbook. You've all heard that statement before, right? 
Take look at the person's check. Where's all your money going? Well, Jesus is saying here, your money should not be the primary source of your treasure. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Lay your treasures in heaven. So, in other words, we're supposed to have a heavenly-minded sort of treasure. The treasures that we possess are not the, the things of this world or the cares of this world, which is basically what he's getting at there too. Almost forgot about that. What is he saying about the about uh, where, where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal? Well, the food and the clothing, these are things that we need, but these are also things that are termed as cares of this world. How can we not be thinking about the cares of this world? Yet the Messiah is telling us that we shouldn't worry about that. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. But what does Jesus mean when he says this? That the eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. The eye of the lamp is the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. Well, the Greek word there for the word healthy is actually, I forgot what the word was, I'm sorry, but I can tell you the definition. The definition of the word basically means single-mindedness or sincerity or happiness. So what the, what, the, what the Bible is saying right here is that the eye of the lamp or the eye of the lamp is the body, but if your eye is healthy, in other words, how do I get this God confidence? There needs to be a sense of single-mindedness about me. There needs to be a sense of sincerity in my thought process toward the Lord. There needs to be a sense of there's only God and God can do it alone. Does that make sense? If our mind is not single-minded, what happens is that the cares of the world tend to come in and sort of uproot that which God has placed into us. Single-mindedness in the sense, maybe this is a good example. Maybe you've uh, witnessed or you've heard people say things like, you know, I, I have a hard time um, just growing in God. I have a hard time um, getting closer in my relationship with God. And this is a sincere and true statement. For we all have our ups and downs within our walk, do we not? But I would have to, when reading this, I would have to interject, what is before our eyes? What is, are, are, are we single-minded? What do we have before us every day, all day? Is that which is before us every day, all day, the cares of the world, the pressures of the world, the bills that I have to pay, this, that, and the other, which should be, we aren't to uh, disregard that. But we are to be aware of these things. So how then, uh, um, how then should I uh, address or look at those things? Well, the Bible says to me that I'm supposed to be single-minded in the sense that I'm to seek those things which are above. Or single-minded in the sense that God is my all in all. God is the one who leads me and guides me and directs me. God is the one who will, in fact, take care of my daily provisions. He goes on to say, if, the, if the, 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 the eye of the lamp is the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. So if your eye or if your mind or if you are single-minded with God, culture might have something totally different to say about that. Culture might say that it doesn't take all of that. Culture might say that you don't have a broad perspective of thinking if all you're doing is thinking about God. Culture, I got to tell you, is wrong. Because the Bible tells me that when my mind is centered on Christ and I'm single-minded thinking about him, it says to me right here that my body is full of light. In other words, my body is full of truth. In other words, my soul is full of God's goodness. My soul is full of God's grace. My understanding increases, and there's nothing that I cannot accomplish as long as I'm single-mindedly focused on the Lord. Does that make sense? It's right here in the text. Israel was given these instructions, and even you and I today, as the body of Christ, are given these instructions as well. Not only that, he goes on to say, but if your eye is bad, healthy means light, or healthy means single-mindedness, but bad means not single-minded. Bad means that I'm thinking about God, but I'm also focused on the things of the world as well. And as we can see here, that ain't such a good idea. If your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If I'm not single-minded, if I'm double-minded, then my whole body is full of darkness. But if I'm single-minded and I'm constantly centered on him, what do I got? Light. 
But it goes on to say, if your eye is bad, the whole body is full of darkness. If then the light in you is actually darkness, then, oh my goodness, how great is the darkness. But then look at what it says here, family, because this right here, I think, is the nuts and bolts of it all with this particular section of this passage. It says here that no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, I'm reading from the ESV here. And in the ESV, it says money, but the KJV says mammon. That word mammon is basically another way of saying foreign or false God. Jesus is saying you can't serve God and money. What often happens a lot of time is that we're believers. We're Christians. We love God. We come to church every Sunday. We sing, we worship, we praise. But at the same time, the cares of this world begin to come into our life and frustrate us and distract us and have us going here, have us thinking that. All of these different things take place in our life. But we serve God, but the cares of this world seem to have me locked into where I can't think about the goodness of God. I can't even focus on how God brought me out from my past. I can't think about it because the cares of this world is uprooting all the good fruit that God has put in me. It's so hard to think about the goodness of God when I have the cares of this world directly in front of me. And what scripture is saying right here is that when that happens, the cares of this world also become our God. And so he's saying it's impossible to serve both God and money. It's impossible to be totally committed to God and at the same time be frustrated and downtrodden and feeling defeated by the cares of this world. You and I, family, we have an assurance. We have a guarantee of our faith in Jesus Christ. There is nothing that we have to do. We don't have to work. We don't have to pray five times daily. We don't have to fast if we don't want to. We don't have to go out and feed the sick. We don't have to do any of these things, but these things are a result of who we are in Christ. And knowing that Christ has fueled us and Christ has fed us and Christ has engaged and intervened in our life like this, somebody tell me, what do I have to worry about? What I wanted to point out earlier is that when we look all throughout the Old Testament, even up to this time, the way that God primarily operated in the world was according to his law. It was according to his law, and he said that you got to get circumcised, Israel, you got to get baptized, Israel. you got to obey the Mosaic principles and practices and rituals. And if you don't do that, you can't be Israel. You can't be my people. In fact, if you weren't Jewish, you couldn't be in relationship with God. The only way at that time you could be in relationship with him was that you had to become Jewish. You had to basically be just like them. But I thank God today for his grace. Because when Christ came, the Bible says that he came to fulfill the law. The Bible says that now because of his grace, that you and I who were once afar off, you and I who were alienated, you and I who had this messed up way of thinking about us, we ain't got to do the religious principles anymore. All we have to do now is believe. Believe in the work that Christ accomplished on the cross for us. And so this is what we see in this passage, family. What we see here is that when Jesus says that, listen, in the kingdom, the reality is this. You won't have to worry about your food. You won't have to worry about what you got to do in order to be in favor with God because um, God's got you. Or, or don't, don't worry about working and doing those things because God's got your daily provision. This is all according to the law. But today, the reason why it says if you don't work, you're not going to eat. The reason why is because God is predominantly working by his grace today. And I'm supposed to go now, and I'm supposed to deal with those things in the workplace. I'm supposed to deal with difficult people. Oh, yeah. I'm supposed to go to Walmart and get a little crazy because people are in front of me with their shopping cart, and I don't like it. I'm supposed to deal with this road rage. You know why? Because of God's grace. And it's because of these things that I get closer to him in relationship. It's because of these things. It's so miraculous, family. It's so miraculous that I don't have to practice stuff. All I got to do is know who he is. Therein lies the love of Christ. The song, 
I will build my life on your love. I will put my trust in you. It is a firm foundation. There's no greater foundation than the love of Christ, than the knowledge and the grace of God. So family, what I've just given you was an explanation and an interpretation of this passage to the best of my ability. But now I would like to share briefly the application of how this all ultimately applies to our life. In other words, here's three things for you that you can take with you. Three things that I think that jump out at us from this passage right here. Verses 16 down through 34, I think, can be broken up into three smaller sections. 16 and 18 is one section. I'm sorry. 19 and 21 is one section. 22 through 24 is another section. And then 25 through 34 is another section. But in the first section, 19 through 21, three ways to develop God confidence. Three ways to understand exactly that we can trust God. In the first section here, it says... Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Three ways to develop God confidence. The first way, we have to get our heart right, family. Excuse me. We have to have our heart right. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 through 15, that the love of Christ causes us to live for him that died for us and rose again. It's the love of Christ that compels us to do the things that we do. Again, I cannot reiterate it enough that we should never try to do things to earn his favor. We don't have to. It's his love that pushes me to do the things that he wants me to do for him. I do what I do because it is a result of who I am in Christ. He loved me when I am a wreck. I'm a mess. I don't deserve him. I've messed up so many times, but yet he saw fit to call me his beloved son. Oh, yeah. The love of Christ compels me to live for him. Does anyone else feel the same? But not only that, heart issues. We have to get our heart right. Number two, I think that we should strive to be all in with him. Now, once again, we're going to make our mistakes because we're human beings. No one's perfect, you know. But I, I, I'm telling you, I, I get mad sometimes at Walmart. I, I, I have a difficult time dealing with people sometimes, you know. I'm working on it. I am. But that's the thing, though. We're all working on this thing. It's a journey. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a journey. But I think that at the same time, though, in this process of growth, that we need to strive to be all in with God. In other words, the Bible says this, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, or that being the affairs of this world, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. In other words, no matter what is going on around us, family, politically, culturally, or any of those things, yes, we should be aware. Yes, we should be prepared. But those should not be the things that, that, that drive us to do what we do. We are, the Bible says, says to us that, that our main focus should not be the affairs of this world or, as it's put, civilian pursuits. We are soldiers in the Lord's army. We, we have been enlisted by him to walk with him and to serve him and to live for him. So this is one way of being all in. That when these tough times and these pressures and the things of the world, the affairs of this world come around us, we must quickly remember who he is and who we are in him. Not to trust in our own self-confidence to get us out of the difficult situations, but to trust in God to display to demonstrate this God confidence and then finally number three finally the Bible says this passage says Matthew 6 chapter or verse 33 we all know this one but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then all these things will be added 
Scripture says over and over and over again in so many different ways that if we would just keep God center, everything will work out. The question is, do we believe it? Do we believe it? Because that's what the Bible tells me. That's what gets me fired up. That's what fuels me. And don't feel bad if we happen to drop the ball along the way. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 7, Paul says it, when I would do good, evil is always present. The things I don't want to do, that's the stuff I do. And the stuff I want to do, that's the stuff I don't do. Oh, who will save me from this body of death? Oh, wretched man that I am. That's what the Bible says. But thank God for Jesus Christ. In closing, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. Colossians 3, 1 through 7, I think fits in perfectly with Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 34. Colossians 3. Actually, if I can go on down to 17, because this is good stuff right here. Colossians 3, starting with verse 1. If then you, family, beloved, people of God, body of Christ, if you then have been raised with Christ, then seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. I got to say that again. If, in fact, we have been raised with Christ, it should be our daily responsibility, duty, privilege, thought to seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. It is so important to understand, family, that what we just read in Matthew chapter 6 is according to the earthly ministry of our Savior. But who we have today who's alive and active in our hearts as our Savior, Jesus Christ, is now seated at the right hand of the Father. When he went to the cross and he spread his arms and he died, he said, it is finished. And now we know that he is the author and the finisher of our faith. The word tells us that. So if I believe it, then somebody tell me, what do I have to worry about? Because that's a large part of Matthew. Don't be worried about the concerns of this world. Verse 2, set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God I submit to you that when Jesus spoke to Israel back then the people as they followed his instructions were not able to follow his instructions according to the wisdom and the power of the cross because there had not been any cross yet Christ had not gone to the cross. But you and I today are able to experience God's grace in a way that those who came before us during that time are not able to. When Paul got saved, he did not have to do any of the requirements according to the Mosaic law. When I read scripture, he got knocked off his high horse and God said, without him saying one word, you're going to follow me. You're going to go through many different persecutions. You're going to have different times of trouble, and you're going to be my man. That's what happened. And as a result of that, after that, it would appear that when we read Scripture, we are all now saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and Christ alone, the work that he accomplished on the cross for us. So this is what the Bible means when it says that you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. We are in unity with Christ. As Christ has died, then you and I have died with them. This is being baptized into Christ by the Spirit of God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Then, therefore, put to death what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is adultery. i got to point this out. The cares of this world was the primary emphasis that Jesus was getting at in Matthew chapter 6. But here, now that Christ is in us, 
We have died with him. We can now relate to him, or he relates to us in every way, and we now live in him. Now the concern seems to be not necessarily the cares of this world, but the concerns seem to be those things that I deal with on the inside that no one might know about. Look at what the text says here. Put to death, therefore, not the cares of this world, which I think are on a basic level, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. Oh, no. Put to death the cares of this world, which are sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is adultery. For Israel at that time, you cannot serve God in man or God in money. That is that false God. That is adultery. But for you and I today, these things here are also known as adultery. Look at how the culture comes upon us. The culture says to us that, yeah, we should celebrate things the same way that everyone else does. The culture comes upon us and says that, yeah, well, uh, this whole Jesus thing, you know, I think that it's uh, just a little too much. The culture comes upon us and says, you can't even mention the name of Jesus because if you do, then you're a bigot. If you do, then you're a hateful person. That's what the culture says. But Jesus says, put to death those things that would cause us to even think about going in cahoots with that type of thought process, that type of mentality. Family, I hope and pray that you've gained a little bit more insight today on the Sermon on the Mount, particularly Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 34. I hope that you've gained insight, and I hope that you're able to take this, and I hope that you can grow more with what the, word, what the Lord has shown us today. Shall we pray? Our God and our Father, we thank you so much for this time. Lord, I thank you for all that you have done. Lord, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for not only what you've done, but what you continue to do. Lord, I thank you for the power that is in your word, Lord God. Father, I thank you for giving us wisdom, for giving us knowledge, for giving us understanding. Lord, I thank you for your grace. Lord, I thank you for accomplishing in us and through us what we cannot accomplish on our own. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth are pleasing to you. I pray, Lord God, that everyone has been given more clarity today, Lord God, but most of all, I pray, Father, that you would bring these things back to our memory. Father, I pray that if there is anyone that does not know you, that may be seeking you, Father, I pray that you would intervene in their life, that you would step into their life, that you would just invade them in such a mighty and awesome way that they cannot refuse you. But they immediately see your goodness. They immediately see your grace and your glory. Lord, we thank you for your love. Lord, we thank you for your mercy. Lord, it's because of your love that we are able to go to one another in spite of ourselves, Lord God, and love our enemies. It's because of your love, Heavenly Father, that we are able to just deal with the daily things of this life. It's because of your love, Lord God, that we are given power, Father God, not to be concerned about the cares of this world, that we're reminded, Father, that you are there for us, that you are alive, and that you are active, moving in our hearts, Lord God. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for everyone who is here. I thank you for their commitment to you. I thank you, Lord God, for everyone who wants to know you, I thank you, Lord God, for everyone who will go forth from this day forward, Lord God, keeping you first, keeping you centered. Lord, you're awesome. You're just. You're good. You're great. And we give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. This is our prayer we ask in your son Jesus' name, the name that is above all names. Amen. Amen.